before they had gone to bed all the men from every part of the city of Sodom both young and old surrounded the house they called to Lot where are the men who came to you tonight bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said no my friends don't do this wicked thing look I have two daughters who have never slept with a man let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them but don't do anything to these men for they've come under the protection of my roof get out of my way they replied and they said this fellow came here as an alien and now he wants to play the judge will treat you worse than them they kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door but the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door then they struck the men who were at the door of the house young and old with blindness so that they could not find the door the two men said to Lot do you have anyone else here sons-in-law sons or daughters or anyone else in the city who belongs to you get them out of here because we're going to destroy this place the outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it and then verses 24 and 25 then the Lord rained down burning sulphur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain including all those living in the cities and also the veg vegetation in the land Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 which says do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman that is detestable Romans chapter 1 verses 22 to 27 although they claimed to be wise they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised Amen because of this God gave them over to shameful lusts even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones in the same way the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 to 11 do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God do not be deceived neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers nor male prostitutes nor homosexual offenders nor thieves nor the greedy nor drunkards nor slanderers nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God and that is what some of you were but you were washed you were sanctified you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God and finally 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 to 11 <clears throat> we know that the law is good if one uses it properly we also know that law is made not for the righteous but for lawbreakers and rebels the ungodly and the sinful the unholy and religious for those who kill their mothers or fathers for murderers for adulterers and perverts for slave traders and liars and perjurers 
and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. And finally, a reading from the BBC website of April the 20th, just what, three weeks ago? The runner-up at the Miss USA beauty pageant says her outspoken opposition to gay marriage cost her first place in the competition. During the televised event, Carrie Prigine, Miss California, said she believed that a marriage should be between a man and a woman. She'd been asked for her views on the subject by one of the judges, celebrity blogger Perez Hilton. It did cost me my crown, said Miss Prigine after the competition. The eventual winner of the pageant was Kristen Dalton, Miss North Carolina. We live in a land where you can choose same-sex marriage or opposite marriage, said Miss Prigine, in a section of the show that's become a popular clip on YouTube. I believe that a marriage should be between a man and a woman, she continued. No offence to anybody out there, but that's how I was raised. The remarks drew a mixture of booing and applause from the audience. Speaking after the show, which was broadcast on Sunday evening in the United States, Miss Prigine said, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I said what I feel. I stated an opinion that was true to myself, and that's all I can do. Hilton, that was the celebrity blogger, said he'd been floored by Miss Prigine's answer, which he said alienated millions of gay and lesbian Americans, their families and their supporters. He told ABC News she lost it because of that question. She was definitely the front runner before that. Keith Lewis, who runs the Miss California competition, released a statement condemning Miss Prigine's comments. As co-director of the Miss California USA, I am personally saddened and hurt that Miss California believes marriage, marriage rights belong only to a man and a woman. The the website goes on to comment, the issue of same-sex marriage is a flashpoint in American politics. Four US states now allow gay marriage, but many other states have passed legislation outlawing it. Actually, that's already out of date because, uh, as you probably know, two days ago, Maine is going to be the fifth state that is going to allow gay marriage, along with Massachusetts, Connecticut, Iowa and Vermont. Genesis 1, verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. So the very first mention of human beings in the Bible essentially tells us that we are sexual beings because it says male and female, he created them. So when I say this morning I'm a man, I'm actually making a sexual statement about myself. I'm describing myself in part by my sexuality, by the way God has made me a member of the human race. So our sexuality is basic to our humanness. It's fundamental. So when we talk about sex, we're talking about something that's at the very heart of who we are. In part, it actually defines us. And it's a subject that needs to be dealt with sensitively, both here and wherever else it might be discussed. As sexual beings, we all have a particular sexual inclination or orientation. The word homosexual, as it applies to men, or lesbian, as it generally applies to women, or indeed the word gay, which is now commonly used for both, describes one of two personal characteristics. It either describes the orientation uh, of an individual, who is sexually attracted to somebody of the same sex or it can describe the behaviour of that individual. In other words, somebody who practices same-sex genital acts. So we must make a distinction between the orientation and the practice, the behaviour. 
And that distinction is important. While some, for instance, never put their desires into practice, others we know actually do. Well, various surveys and investigations have been made to discover what percentage of a society could be described as homosexual. There was a British survey I came across that was conducted almost 20 years ago now. It reckoned that 1.1% of men had had a homosexual partner during the previous year, while the number of women who in the same period of time have had lesbian partners was somewhat less. Well, after the Bible has described us as being made in the image of God, we read that, regardless of our gender or sexual orientation, we, through choice, became sinners. And the area of our sexuality is no exception. That was also impacted by the choice of going against God. Dr. Merville Vincent of the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School wrote this. He said, in God's view, I suspect we are all sexual deviants. I doubt if there is anyone who's not had a lustful thought that deviated from God's perfect ideal of sexuality. As you know, uh, the founder of this movement, George Verwer, is very open and straightforward and honest speaking on this subject. And more than once I've heard him say from, from the front, if there's anybody here who's never had a sexual temptation, he says, I want you straight after the message to come here and autograph my Bible. And then he says, and then go straight to the doctors. Well, just as ancient Greek society followed the teachings of Plato, Socrates and Aristotle, which idealised, actually, same-sex love, so the gay community over the last few decades has urged strongly that we actually return to the Greek Enlightenment period in sexual matters. So the question is, are same-sex partnerships an option for Christians? Well, back in 1977, what's that, over 30 years ago now, the lesbian and gay Christian movement in the UK said a resounding yes a heterosexual marriage and a homosexual partnership are two equally valid alternatives. Actually, probably today they've replaced the phrase homosexual partnership with gay marriage. A similar group in the USA wrote this, We believe that Christian gay people are part of God's kingdom. Doctrinally, we are evangelical in the historic sense of believing the basics of Christianity as revealed in the Word of God. Well, interestingly enough, almost to the day, 20 years ago, May 1989, it was Denmark who became the first nation to legalise homosexual marriage. And the recent changes to the law in the UK has resulted really in a flood of homosexual marriages and I suppose the one that's best remembered a few years ago, very high profile so-called marriage, was between Elton John and his lover David Furnish. So, is our, are our, is our sexual preference just a matter of taste? Is it just expressing how we are made? Is it a case of satisfying our desires? Well, as you've realised, if you've been at these ethical lectures we have to search the scriptures which we believe are our authority to help us understand the truth as it's been given to us by God I read a number of key passages earlier I expect you're familiar with just about all of them and not surprisingly the interpretation of these is hotly disputed by the gay Christian community they take issue with the classic understanding of the Sodom and Gomorrah passage, claiming it is about violations of hospitality rather than homosexual practice. Leviticus verses, well, they say they're just cultic taboos. And the references in the book of Romans only refer to shameless orgies. Take, for instance, the list 
of sins in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. It's claimed that they are more to do with male prostitution and the corruption of the young rather than homosexual practice. But, when we take a closer look at the text, we find the same Greek words are used in both passages. There's two words here. One is malakoi, uh, which you would translate as male prostitutes, and arsenokoite, which is translated homosexual offenders. John Stott explains that malakoi means literally soft to the touch and referred to males who played the passive role. Arsenokoite means literally male in a bed and refers to the one who took the active role in homosexual sex. Peter Coleman draws for us the obvious conclusion. Taken together, Paul's writings repudiate homosexual behaviour as a vice of the Gentiles in Romans, as a bar to the kingdom in Corinthians and as offence to be repudiated by the moral law in Timothy. I mean, I haven't got time to look in depth at, at more of these passages, but for those who are interested, they are well rehearsed in almost every Bible commentary that you can find. There's also some other books in the library there that are helpful. But it is amazing, isn't it, the incredible lengths that people will go to to try to make these passages mean other than what they so obviously mean. It's a little short of ridiculous and, and to me smacks a bit of desperation in their thinking and writing. Robertson McQuilkin said, It is a mystery to me why proponents and exponents of homosexuality spend so much energy trying to prove what the sin of Sodom's men was or was not. Well, in the very beginning of Genesis itself, God's plans and purposes are clear. The creation ordinance is a divine ordinance. And once we understand the teaching of the Bible on sex and marriage, it's not hard to see that the, home, the whole homosexual question is out of order, it's a distortion. Adam's need for companionship was met by a woman, Eve. She was his complement, his companion, specially created for him. She was pronounced suitable and would be his sexual partner and was so designed that the two are, are complementary. She was perfectly designed, wasn't she, to be one flesh with him, physically joined with him in a way that man can never be with another man or indeed woman with another woman. This physical uniting was not only to express love, but as you know from the marriage service, also for the procreation of children. Uh, we recently uh, saw three times recorded in the Bible this verse, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And it's, I think, not insignificant that the pro-homosexual advocates usually omit these verses from their discussions. It's clear then, again, Robertson McQuilkin expresses it, he says, God ordained exclusive, permanent, monogamous marriage as the only way to achieve the full unity of two human beings to provide children and home and to reflect God's own relationship to mankind. Adam and Eve was God's arrangement the pervasive teaching of scripture is to condemn all sexual relationships outside the heterosexual marriage bond. This being true, it needs to be said that every kind of sexual relationship which deviates from God's revealed intention is displeasing to him and under his condemnation, such as adultery, which we considered in depth on, um, on Thursday. And constantly singling out Homosexual relationships for special condemnation is neither balanced nor is it fair. But you'll understand that, of course, that's the subject for today's devotion. But still the arguments come from the homosexual, Christian, homosexual, gay lobby. The accusation is made that the biblical writers had no concept of two men or two women 
falling in love with each other. The notion had never entered their heads. A popular claim is that Paul was a child of his culture, a child of his age who was unaware of any idea of a settled homosexual orientation and relationship. However, this is extremely unlikely. He lived in a culture saturated with homosexual conduct of every kind and Greek homosexual love was common. It, it was everywhere. Greek literature promoted homosexual love as the ideal, especially the love of a man for a boy. And a succession of Roman emperors were promiscuously homosexual. But there's, however, another argument that is increasingly heard today from the likes of the lesbian and gay Christian movement. The cry is, I'm gay because God made me that way. It's my nature, so gay must be good. Some also argue it's natural because in many primitive societies it's tolerated. In advanced civilizations such as Greece, it was frequently seen in the leadership. Some people even claiming acceptance because it's widespread in animals. Well, it hardly needs saying that the last argument, that animal behaviour, should somehow set standards for human behaviour, can be thrown out immediately. Paul, of course, argued for the exact opposite. He described women who had exchanged natural relations for unnatural, and men who had, quote, abandoned natural relations. So that then begs the question, what did Paul mean by natural? What is natural? Well, what is unnatural is simply what is against God's created order. And so we're back again to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Natural is heterosexual behaviour. Unnatural is all other sexual behaviour, including homosexual practice, which strikes at the very heart of creation by perverting it. It therefore contravenes what has been divinely ordained. David Field says this, to ask whether homosexuality is natural is to ask whether God made it and the answer has to be in the negative. Another argument put forward by supporters of homosexual practice is that of the quality of relationships it produces. For instance, here's a report from the Methodist Church. Quote, for homosexual men and women, permanent relationships characterised by love can be an appropriate Christian way of expressing their sexuality. And the former Bishop of Salisbury, John Baker, was giving a lecture on issues in human sexuality when he astonished the audience suddenly in the course of his speech by saying that sex in marriage can be a true making of love and that, quote, erotic love can and often does have the same beneficial effects in the life of same-sex couples. So maybe here is an appropriate place to emphasise that the vast majority of gay relationships are brief and that those who practise homosexuality are overwhelmingly promiscuous. Think of my friend Andrew. He served on an OM land team many years ago and I believe that's where he first started experiencing gay relationships in the bars of the different towns he visited. Today he's promiscuously gay, he's HIV positive and I'd have to say he's also very lonely. Uh, some time ago he showed me some photographs of a holiday he'd been on and he pointed to a couple of lads, he said, oh those two, they used to be my boyfriends. He said, we're still talking but they're no longer my boyfriends. He assured me that they were still on good terms. But the thing about him is I, I see this incredible loneliness characterises his heart and of course in the process of all this he's overthrown the Christian faith. The result of Thomas Schmidt's research studies led him to the conclusion that promiscuity among homosexual men is not a mere stereotype and it is not merely the majority experience. It's virtually the only experience. In short, there is practically no comparison possible to heterosexual marriage in terms of either fidelity, faithfulness or longevity. Tragically, lifelong faithfulness is almost non-existent 
in the homosexual experience. In addition, it's hard to justify that homosexual partnerships are just as much an expression of love as heterosexual relationships when one considers the known physical damage and the danger involved. Dr. Satanova gives us the brute facts about the adverse consequences of homosexuality or homosexual practice such as infectious hepatitis which can lead to liver cancer. There are seven viral, four viral and seven non-viral infections which are transmitted by anal sex as well as rectal cancer not to mention HIV AIDS. And once again we find the false argument that posits love as the only substitute and discards all other commandments because Jesus said if you love me you will keep my commandments. You see if love is the only basis then why can't the polygamist have as many wives as he pleases and the married man demonstrate his love to another woman by committing adultery. Some in the gay movement now feel that they've been liberated. Indeed they march under the banner of gay liberation or gay rights. But what is it they've been liberated from? What right do they feel has been withheld from them? If it's liberation from discrimination and rejection, if it's a liberation from homophobia, then they have a point, an important point which needs addressing. If it's liberation from a society that refuses to recognise homosexual marriage as an equal alternative to a heterosexual marriage, then this is not a right that is theirs since God hasn't given it to them or anybody else. True liberation isn't freedom from God's revealed will and purpose, it is freedom from our own self-will rebellion to do God's will. So the only Christian alternative then to heterosexual marriage is singleness and sexual abstinence. But the world screams, no, you can't live without sex. Actually you can. It's not essential to human fulfilment. I spent the first 47 years of my life as a single person. You don't die from lack of sex. You die from lack of food, okay? There are plenty of single men and women who have never experienced sex and yet have lived God-glorifying lives. If you were to take all the single men and women out of the mission field right now, you'd see a massive impact on the work of the Gospel around the world. It is possible for those with a homosexual orientation to be celibate, but it is definitely not easy. Anyone who reads, for instance, Alec Davidson's book, The Returns of Love, will not fail to be moved by it (coughs) as he struggles to live a celibate Christian life. He talks of, quote, this monster that lurks in the depths. In another place he talks about the torment of love. The reality is that all of us are called to different forms of self-denial, to the way of the cross. <clears throat> God can give us the power to live a godly single life and to know his forgiveness when we fail. A couple of years ago I was speaking on a, a Christian uh, holiday, it was a camping holiday actually in the south of France, and every night one of the leaders would stand up and give his or her testimony. One evening it was the term of the cook, Uh, he gave his testimony and then he said I'm going to share something with you that I've never ever shared before but he just said he felt that for the first time in his life he needed to do he said he'd come to Christ when he was quite young but had also discovered that he was gay when he was quite young he said he realised and believed it was clear from the Bible that homosexual practice was wrong and that he'd actually had a few one night stands which he'd repented of and he was now committed to seeking a holy life he asked us to pray for him and then he said when this holiday is over I'm going to go back home and I'm going to tell my committed Christian parents about my orientation he said uh, I, uh, I expect they might be very shocked but I really would like you to pray that they might present a godly reaction to them when I'm sharing this personal testimony. And 
I just so admired this guy. I mean, clearly it was not easy for him, first of all, to share that in front of the rest of us as one of the leaders, and then to confess his own failures. My heart went out to him and I realised again how much we need to support, encourage, pray for, be honest ourselves with those who openly and transparently face such struggles. Two evangelists I know, one is a veteran, he's been evangelist for many years, and the other was a new recruit, was sharing a caravan on an evangelistic campaign. It's one of these small caravans, uh, two single beds, each side of a sort of a narrow aisle, a little kitchenette up the end. And on the first evening, as each of them were getting ready for bed, the older one said to the younger guy, he said, I want you to know that I do face struggles with homosexual temptation. He said, and you can help me by just being careful how you dress and undress each night before you go to bed. I thought, wow. I mean, what, what transparency, what, what courage, what honesty. I came across a website yesterday called Accepting Evangelicals, to which almost 300 Christians, including many leaders, have signed their names. Those who have signed either practice same-sex relationships or are sympathetic towards those who do. I noticed one of the names there was a name that might, won't mean much to a lot of you, but to some of us who've been round the British evangelical scene, we'll remember it well, Dr. Roy Clements. So how do Christian leaders who practice committed same-sex relationships justify their beliefs and behaviour. And bear in mind there are a significant, one could also almost say a growing number. I guess they would say that the biblical prohibitions on the practice of homosexuality should be ignored because they firstly undermine the positive aspects of same-sex relationships and secondly because they come from a sexually naive, primitive, earlier, unilluminated period of history. Truth, according to them, cannot be divine if it calls into question one's sexual orientation, as the latter is simply a given. However, this doesn't address the issues of how other sexual experiences or preferences can be evaluated biblically. What about polygamy, which I've already mentioned, extramarital affairs, multiple partners, the use of male or female prostitutes, or even paedophilia, if that's your sexual inclination, your taste or your or orientation. Nor can they, or these people, explain why biblical notions of sin, atonement, salvation, hell, judgment, should still be a basic and non-negotiable part of contemporary Christian thinking given the Bible's so-called unreliable views on homosexuality. See, the problem is, if you take a pair of scissors to the Bible, everybody cuts in a different place and cuts out different parts, just according to what they can accept or what they can't accept. Is it possible for homosexual people to be healed? Now, of course, many homosexual people would categorically and angrily deny they need healing as they would not see themselves as being unwell. Certainly many studies have been done to ascertain the reason that some seem to be gay even from an early age. Recently, there was talk about a possible gay gene, but that was soon discounted for lack of scientific evidence. Some studies suggest that it's the dominance of the same-sex parent that is the reason. Is it inherited? Or is it learned? And if it's learned, can it be unlearned? Martin Hallett was active in the gay scene for many years and he's written an honest account of his pilgrimage to Christ and of his life following his conversion. His book is called I'm Learning to Love and it documents some of the ongoing challenges he faces. Most of those who come to Christ from a homosexual background experience a gradual process of leaving behind their old distorted way of thinking and a new realisation of themselves as men and women in relationship to God. Finally, I have to say this. We as Christians have largely failed this group of people. The very existence of the lesbian, gay, Christian movement is a testimony to that. 
and is in part a rebuke to mainline churches for failing to accept them. We've been guilty of what's called homophobia, which is probably best described as an unbalanced and disproportionate reaction to something that we don't fully understand ourselves. We fail to show the love of Christ that we talk so much about and sadly instead we've joined in the mockery with the world of homosexual people by mimicking stereotypes of the way that they talk or effeminacy or or, or the way they move. We've been as guilty as other people of viewing those made in the image of God. The world may act thus, but we have not so learned Jesus Christ. And the Corinthian church, for all its faults, reached out to them, witnessed their conversion, accepted them and loved them. After all, we alone have the answer for the lonely, for the lost and for the unloved. Let's not withhold that love from those who need it the most. And if we don't offer them true Christian love, then they will seek for love in places where despite what they might say, there is actually only a useless substitute and an unhelpful and a damaging counterfeit. I think it would be appropriate for us now to pray. I'm going to suggest we pray in this way. First of all, we repent of stereotyping people, of judgmentalism, of ridicule and of mockery. I'm sure many of you, including myself, have have viewed people in that way who have a homosexual orientation and maybe we could decide from now on that never again will we make a joke or a fun of the way these people are. Can we also pray for any Christians we know who are struggling with homosexual temptations? Maybe some have actually, because of this, left the Christian faith altogether. And can we pray that God will help us to somehow love and accept everybody, regardless of their creed, their race, or indeed their sexual orientation? I'm going to invite us to pray in twos, and then afterwards I'm going to ask Uh, Daniel to come and close in prayer and then he's going to bring us some more announcements. So can you get into twos or threes if that's more comfortable? Remember we're going to first of all ask God's forgiveness for our non-Christian reaction so often to people with these orientations. Pray for any we know who are struggling with these uh, temptations and ask God to give us a love that will accept everyone.
we'll just bring our prayers to close. And uh, continue to pray in small groups. Pray for virus recovery as soon as possible. The operation yesterday afternoon went well. We praise God for that and uh, the quick and complete recovery and healing. Let's pray for that. Also, let's pray for the safe arrival of Captain Harry Nikon coming arriving this afternoon and maybe arriving at the ship around 5.30 or 6 or 7 o'clock, 6.30 today. Also, what is the big day today? I night. So let's pray for I night as well in small groups and then let me close all together. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day. Thank you for giving us such a bright day. And especially the school children are enjoying their camp. We've been praying for the good weather. And uh, every day you have given them so far the good weather. We have pray that you continue to give them good weather. Thank you for safety, we pray. Uh, for their, And also we pray that they will receive a great spiritual input uh, in their lives as they spend uh, two days in the camp. Father, I also want to thank you for the operation of Vera. I went well, and we pray that you give her a good recovery and a complete recovery uh, so that later on okay, you can join us uh, in Chilung or Overland. We pray. we pray for the family that you just give them peace and the strength and comfort at this time. And uh, we just pray that they will experience your goodness in their lives. So we pray for the the, uh, the financial uh, support needs to be come in to cover some of the, um, the, the hospital fees and we just pray that we can see your goodness in that as well. So we pray for the safe arrival of Captain Harry. We thank you for him and his commitment to come and to serve. We pray that uh, he will settle in well here and uh, as he serves here for three months that uh, he will see your goodness uh, as he takes a measure uh, and huge responsibility of looking after this old vessel and taking the legal responsibility of uh, maintaining this ship. We just pray that you'll be with him. And uh, uh, Captain, Harry, uh, Captain Harry and uh, Captain Ernest's handover will go also smoothly as they pass this responsibility on to each other. So we thank you for giving us another uh, I night uh, minister opportunity, and thank you for the preparation has been done. And with tonight we uh, present... Uh, the, the love of Christ and the, the gospel message. We pray that many will come and that their hearts will be prepared, that our hearts will be prepared, and we just pray that your Holy Spirit work in a very special way that the gospel message will go through the hearts of these people. And many will make their commitment to Christ Jesus for the first time, and uh, many will come much closer to Christ, and also those who are already in Christ to have a deeper commitment to share the love of Jesus Christ with other people in whatever circumstances they are in. We thank you for our teaching this morning. We thank you for your clear uh, teaching in the Bible that the, the about the sexual orientation and the Father we pray that uh, of course we need to continue to welcome and understand and uh, should not discriminate those who are uh, in the same sex orientation and the practices 
Thank you. So, Father, we just pray that we just pray that you open their hearts and their eyes and can see what the Bible teaches and to come to uh, know and to come to uh, you know, different changes as well. And especially we pray for the churches around the world, some of the denominations and some of the churches around the world, which is even the top leaders of the Christian churches, the bishops and the, the pastors, if they allow these things happening to, 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 to continue the ministry, and we just pray that you uh, would make it very clear to them as well that uh, there is not a right way to go. And we pray uh, that the Christians will have a, 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 a clear teaching, although we want to accept people and uh, embrace people. But uh, from the Bible, we see the Christian leaders are not should be in these positions. And this is uh, moving so quickly in these areas, even in the Christian church. We just pray that your the Holy Spirit is move in the churches to uh, bring the clear teaching and also the purity and holiness in the church as well. We just commit this day to you, and uh, especially that everything is happening today. We bless the, all the visitors who are coming here today in the name of Christ, and we just pray that they will be to you today. In Jesus Christ, and for his glory, we pray. Amen. And a great day.